The year is 1915. The European continent is in a raging conflict, a war to end all wars. America will enter the war in two years, but is merely keeping their eyes on the conflict. In Kenosha, Wisconsin, a young and influential man is born, George Orson Welles. George Orson Welles is the author of the most influential radio broadcast ever produced, *The War of the Worlds*. He is also a man whose life and works have defined a generation. Citizen Kane, often regarded as one of the greatest movies of all time, and a movie I had to study multiple times in college, is one of Wells' most influential works. But before we can talk about the man Wells would become, we need to talk about how he started. Every great hero has an origin, and Wells is no different. Today, we're going to be discussing the life of Orson Wells. His ups, his downs, and how this influential man would go on to impact the world. I'm Noah Martin, your ever-present narrator, and you're listening to Retrospection Radio. It's time to learn about the men that made us. Wells came from an affluent family. They were well off and enjoyed a comfortable life. His mother, Beatrice Ives Wells, and his father, Richard Head Wells, would separate when Orson was only four years old, in 1919. Richard, his father and famous inventor of a bicycle lamp, would become an alcoholic. I don't know why Richard did what he did. But it's common that men drink to forget their issues, and in this case, he had a broken family by the 1920s. At this time, it was unacceptable to have broken families, and my logical guess would be that though he was successful as an inventor, he felt shame and disappointment that he couldn't hold his family together. Wells's mother was a pianist, and played during lectures at a local art institution. In 1924. Beatrice died of hepatitis. Orson Welles was only nine at the time. By this point, we see that Orson Welles' life has already been filled to the brim with familiar, familial trouble. Up until this point, Welles had been pursuing music, but after his mother's death, his passions faded away. The next period of Welles' life was hectic. He went to an art colony, and then he moved in with his father, who traveled the world. Wells saw Jamaica and the Far East before returning once again to the United States with his father. They stayed in a hotel, which eventually burned down, and he and his father then would settle in Illinois. Onlookers often wondered who took care of whom in the relationship. Wells' father was still a drunk, and Orson had never really had a childhood. He was forced to grow up far before he should have. In 1926, Wells attended a seminary for boys. It was a seminary that allowed him to use his creative mind. Wells would stage theater productions and study subjects that interested him. This went on for four years until 1930, when the last of the few people he had in his life was violently taken from him. At 15 years old. Orson Welles told his father that he would stop seeing him. Welles's hope is that the ultimatum, he or the bottle, would help his father ease off the alcohol and come back into his life. His father, alone in a hotel room in Chicago, drank himself to death. He died of heart and kidney failure. Orson Welles never forgave himself, feeling that it was his ultimatum that caused his father to drink himself to death. Orson Welles was now alone in the world, with the only family he had left being his brother Dicky, who was currently institutionalized. Welles chose Maurice Bernstein, a family friend, 
and someone whom he had lived with a few years prior, before seeing parts of the world. Wells graduated from the boys' seminary school and was awarded a scholarship to Harvard College. But Wells wanted more than what college life had to offer. His father had left him an inheritance, and Orson Wells was going to use it. Orson Welles, now without a family, used his inheritance from his father's death to travel to Ireland. He spent his days walking around the country and painting, though one day he saw the Gate Theater, and he walked inside. He claimed to the manager, Hilton Edwards, that he was a Broadway star. Edwards didn't believe him, but he did see a spark in the young Welles. Welles was brash and confident and Edwards later granted him an audition. Edwards was so impressed by the audition that he hired Wells to appear at the Gate Theater for roughly a year. Wells played minor roles and worked on producing his own works in Dublin. In 1932, Wells left to find work in London. However, he was unable to attain a permit and was forced to return to the United States. Wells continued writing and staging shows, eventually writing a series of books titled The Mercury Shakespeare. He traveled North Africa while working on illustrations for his books. Those educational books would be printed for a number of decades to come. Wells found his first bit of fame and would continue climbing up the ladder. In 1933, Wells attended a party after receiving an invite from his old headmaster and mentor from his seminary school. At the party, Wells met a series of people which eventually led him to being immediately hired with a touring contract lasting 36 weeks. The first show he did was in Buffalo, New York. It was here that, in his time off, he was introduced to yet another person. Wells was somebody that people wanted to know and it was clear from the amount of jobs Wells received that he was someone more than capable of performing. In 1934, Wells got his first job on the radio. It was in 1934 that Wells would host a drama festival, inviting people he had met from all over the world and producing his first film, The Hearts of Age, a relic eventually lost to time. Until the 1960s. It was a surrealist film with little plot and strong invocations of death. When approached about the film in his later years, Wells seemed ornery and annoying that it was ever rediscovered. At the end of 1934, the same year he had begun some of his earliest known creative works, he was married to Virginia Nicholson, first of many wives. Her family was less than excited that she was marrying a Broadway actor, but Wells did his best to put her family at ease. He paid for a grand ceremony and wore the best clothes he could, which he had borrowed from a friend of his. Wells performed in Romeo and Juliet in a production of Panic over the course of 1935. When Panic moved to CPS Radio, Orson Welles was brought on to perform a scene of a news report describing the events happening. He continued working as a radio actor in Manhattan, extending his network of friends, of whom most would become the core of the Mercury radio theater programs. The next few years saw Orson become one of the most well-known and requested radio actors in New York. He worked at CBS Broadcasting and the Federal Theater Project, among other places, he produced an entirely African-American production of Macbeth, which opened to raving reviews. That production then toured for a number of weeks in Dallas, Texas. By 1937, Wells had produced, directed, and sometimes acted in multiple extremely successful shows. 
All the while, he was still acting on radio. He was known for being in such a high demand that he would literally run from one studio to the other to record a few lines before running to yet another studio. He was making upwards of $2,000 a week, which is roughly $39,000 a week adjusted for today's inflation. Orson Welles performed in The March of Time, Hamlet, The Fall of the City, The Shadow, and many, many more productions. In 1937, Mutual Network gave Wells the job of adapting Les Miserables for radio. Wells became a writer, director, and debuted the script through his brand new theater, Mercury Theater, where he invented the use of narration in radio. The theatrical success of the Mercury Theater was unparalleled, and CBS Radio invited Orson Welles to create a summer program. This is where he would found the Mercury Theater on the air and produce weekly, hour-long shows presented in radio play format. He crafted classic literary works, along with original music, into radio dramas that were an instant success. Within a year, Orson Welles had created a story and broadcast that would stand the test of time. The War of the Worlds. Originally written by H.G. Wells, The War of the Worlds was a book detailing an alien invasion of the world. Orson Welles would adapt this book into an hour-long show presented as a real, factual news story turned radio drama. Many listeners who were channel surfing would tune in to the broadcast. And after missing the introduction, which stated that the following program was fake, they would become confused on whether or not the broadcast was fake. Panic began to spread about the Martian invasion of Earth, and even Adolf Hitler mentioned the broadcast. Wells was already a success, and his fame grew more and more with each broadcast he produced. Yet the Mercury Theater on the air would only last until 1938. Wells had been garnering attention from Hollywood, and though he initially declined offers, the ability to see his creative works on the big screen, along with more independent creative choice in the process, drew his attention. The Mercury Radio Theater would become sponsored by Campbell Soup and be renamed to the Campbell Playhouse. Wells continued working for the Campbell Playhouse, commuting between New York and California until 1940, where Wells decided not to renew his contract and left the theater that he had created only a few years earlier. Wells was moving on to bigger things, though Mercury Theater still remained close to his heart and a part of who he was. RKO Radio Pictures offered Orson Welles one of the best contracts ever offered to an untried filmmaker, giving Welles the opportunity to write, produce, direct, and perform in two major motion pictures along with almost complete creative control, including Welles' right to the final cut of each film. This was much to Hollywood studios' dismay who mocked the contract in the news. RKO rejected Wells' first two movie proposals, but agreed on his third, a movie by the name of Citizen Kane. Wells co-wrote the film with Herman J. Mankiewicz, a playwright for the Campbell Playhouse. Wells produced, directed, and starred in the film. In his strange practice, Wells gave Mankiewicz 300 pages of notes and had him write a script, while Wells himself wrote his own script. He then crafted together the two scripts and added scenes, making a Frankenstein of both scripts. He received backlash for his actions and claims that he undervalued Mankiewicz's work. Wells heard these cries and denied them. Wells hired actors from Mercury Theater and proceeded to film Citizen Kane in ten weeks. RKO Pictures received threats from Hollywood about releasing the film, and even some bribes from studios like MGM if they would destroy the existing prints of the film. 
While waiting for Citizen Kane to be released, Wells produced and directed the original Broadway production Native Son at the St. James Theater. Citizen Kane was released to limited audiences and immediately received overwhelming critical success. It was voted Best Picture of 1941 and received nine Academy Award nominations. It did not, however, win any Oscars due to the fact that Hollywood was still butthurt about the film. RKO hired Wells to continue directing, and he proceeded to make hit after hit, including The Magnificent Ambersons and Journey into Fear. New management swept through RKO Pictures, and Wells was soon fired and blackballed in Hollywood. It would continue on, traveling Europe and the Americas over the course of ten years. He produced multiple television shows, guest starred on radio shows, and got back into filmmaking, though it was without Hollywood support. He continued doing this for decades until the 1970s, where his career began to stagnate. Over the course of the 1970s, Orson Welles' career began to stagnate. He would produce another film, F for Fake, which was a film essay about an art forger. The film was rejected in the United States due to nudity. Welles would continue guesting on shows, acting as a narrator most of the time. Though he wasn't using his creative genius as much anymore, he was still enjoying his life. He did multiple commercials for alcoholic products, and though most actors would see the death of a career by doing this, Wells had a lot of fun. And he directly impacted each business that hired him, including Paul Masson Vineyards, which saw an increase in sales by one-third. Wells continued narrating documentaries and commercials. A man who spent most of his life narrating and using his creative genius to produce some of the most influential stories of all time was reduced to narrating for TV documentaries and obscure movies. Wells recorded an interview on October 9, 1985, with Barbara Leeming. They spent the evening talking of Wells's life, the good and the bad parts. Wells returned to his house in Hollywood and worked into the early hours of the morning, typing stage directions for a project he had been working on. A project he had planned to shoot with Gary Graver in UCLA the next day. Wells died of a heart attack that morning. He was 70 years old. Wells had a small, closed funeral for his closest friends and family members. Chris Wells' feeder described the funeral as an awful experience. The public held a memorial tribute in which many people he had worked with over the decades spoke. Joseph Cotton would later say, I know what his feelings were regarding his death. He did not want a funeral. He wanted to be buried quietly in a little place in Spain. And in 1987, Wells and his now deceased wife, Paola Mori, were taken to Ronda, Spain, and buried in an old well covered by flowers at the estate of a lifelong friend, Antonio Ordonez. Thus ends the successful yet somber life of Orson Welles. Orson Welles is someone to look up to. He spent his entire life telling influential stories and standing up for what he thought was right. His stories crossed boundaries that broke societal expectations. Welles always saw himself as a progressive Democrat and it showed in his work. He was actively against the racism of the United States and an advocate against segregation. Yet he was never a person who blindly followed others. He often spoke out against his own party, and the workings of Hollywood, and the stories people told. Orson Welles wasn't afraid to speak his mind and tell a story. His life, his actions, his writings have all inspired me, and should inspire you. Welles is a living example of, no matter what bad things happen, you can still come out on top. 
He was blackballed in Hollywood, yet he continued making films. He lost his father and mother to divorce and death, and yet he was successful by the age of 20. When you write stories, when you decide what to tell and who to tell it, keep in mind that you should never be afraid to go against the grain of society. Orson Welles lived his life shattering boundaries with every tale he told, and was wildly successful because of it. Yet this wasn't a complete history of his life, his feelings, his emotions. It never can be. And it never will be. I've tried my best to sum up Orson Welles, but can you really sum up a man that changed the world? To quote Welles himself, I don't think any word can explain a man's life. I am Noah Martin, your ever-present narrator. Thank you for listening to tonight's episode on Orson Welles. If you liked it, feel free to listen to any of our podcasts at www.retrospectionradio.com. You can donate to us at our Ko-fi, which is linked in the description, if you want to hear more content like this. If not, please feel free to like us on your favorite podcatcher and leave a comment or review. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit. You'll find our links in the bio of this episode. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode.